Okay, and we're up and running live again. We'll give people a, a few seconds to show up here as we did last time too. Um, and again, everybody who's watching on replay here, thanks for watching and, and finding this. Uh, we've got some other videos. This is a continuation of the game that we began last week. So if you haven't seen that one yet, please look through our YouTube channel and Facebook to find that one and you can get caught up that way. Uh, we've got a couple other games that we did in this program too, so please feel free to explore in there and see what else we've done. But we're going to be launching into the second part of this game, which is the Battle of Midway, this challenge that we, uh, the Naval War College Museum versus the National Naval Aviation Museum. So uh, looking forward to starting this again here. We kind of got through the initial phases of this in our first session last week where we were mainly trying to find each other. And um, we have started to find each other, I would say. Jared, do you think that's uh, accurate <laughs> on your part? I think it is on my part. Uh, not so much on my part, but I know where you got to go. So That's right. <laughs> We spent a good four or five turns uh, trying to find the opposing fleets. And I think we're gonna start to get some more action, uh, get some some fireworks going this time around. But but um, welcome everyone again. We've got uh, a few people watching live now, so we can go ahead and jump right in. But again, um, this is the uh, next in our series of war game programs that we've run for the Naval War College Museum. Just trying to give everybody a little sense of what wargaming is all about, um, tie it into the professional wargaming we do at the college, um, and uh, get a chance to just talk about strategy, the art of wargaming, the kinds of things that we deal with at the college all the time. So our challenge tonight here again is a uh, part two of the game that we started last week against the National Naval Aviation Museum. And joining me again to help with this and uh, to play against me, first of all, is our opponent, uh, which is Jared Galloway from the National Naval Aviation Museum. We also have Mark Levitt from the museum and uh, Guy Nasuti, a historian with Naval History and Heritage Command who will be commenting and uh, uh, criticizing if we do anything too badly. So <laughs> we'll hear about it. <laughs> but we had some good discussion about it last week. So looking forward to, to uh, continuing that again. Um, so let me, I'm going to go to my screen here. The way, again, this is working. If you didn't get a chance to watch last week, um, Jared and I are playing uh, a turn-based game here that uh, works on a, you can see the map here that's in the corner. I'm going to scroll over in just a minute. Um, but this map is basically the area where the Battle of Midway took place. I'm playing the Americans, Jared's playing the Japanese. Um, we began by setting up our, our, our units kind of in a free setup. We are not tied in any way to the historical strategies that were used here. We're just trying to find out uh, where we're getting a chance to play this out as we would do it and see if we do better or worse than the historical uh, participants. So looking at my screen here, I'm going to jump over and just give you a quick update on where things stand. So this is the middle of the map, and this is Midway Island here. So you can see the American base. This is where Jared needs to get to. Uh, in order to win the game for him, he's got to land on Midway and actually capture uh, those three spaces. Um, and you can see he's got an aircraft here who's kind of spying on me to, I think, see uh, which of my aircraft take off from there and, and uh, pounce on them as they do. Um, but I'm, I'm going to not show all the map because I, uh, Jared is watching this and I don't necessarily want to show him what I've got going on. But most of the action uh, last time took place kind of over here. This is the direction that the Japanese are approaching from. You're looking at my screen here so you can see these are things that I have spotted um, with some of my aircraft. I'd flown the B-26s and the B-17s that are on Midway Island out here to try and spot the approaching Japanese fleet. So you can see where I did that over here on this turn. Um, again, if you didn't watch last week, an important thing to keep in mind, Jared and I do not see everything on the map. Uh, we only see each other's units if we spot them, if we have uh, our own unit that's close enough to spot something. So as you're watching, when you're watching my screen, you're just going to see what I have spotted and what I can see. And likewise, when it's Jared's turn, uh, the map will be different because you're going to be able to see all of his units, but then you'll only see uh, the units of mine that he has spotted. So you all will have the God's eye view. You will know what's going on. Uh, Jared and I don't quite have the full picture yet, but that's part of the challenge here is to try and uh, figure out where the other guy is and uh, and see what we can do about that. So 
Uh, we're on turn five here. It's about a 16 turn game total. Uh, we'll see how far we get here tonight. We may need to continue this again next Thursday, but we'll see again how we do here in the next hour or so. If uh, we get to a point where it's pretty clear that we've got a decision, uh, then this may be it for tonight, but we'll we'll talk about that and then we'll, we'll do a quick wrap up at the end. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and take my turn. And uh, I already told you about Midway Island here. I'm going to kind of describe what you're looking at uh, up in this corner here. You can see some ships of mine that are going to be moving out. I am kind of have a couple other groups here. I'm scrolling down on the kind of to the east eastern portion of the map where I've got my next, I'll call it a task force <laughs> that I'm that I'm looking at. When I had uh, started out from my turn, of course, my main goal is about trying to defend Midway Island, but I also have some secondary goals, which is to try, uh, not surprisingly, to sink some Japanese aircraft carriers if I can. So I'm, I'm trying to set myself up to be able to do that, but always with an eye towards defending Midway Island first and foremost. If I can do that, um, even if I don't sink any Japanese carriers, technically I will have won. But of course, I'm going to try at least do at least as well as uh, as the Americans did in the real thing. I am starting to encounter some of the Japanese search planes with my own search planes, so kind of always have an eye on where they're going and also where they're coming from. Um, it can be very telling to kind of look at the direction that the planes are flying in to sort of look at the reverse direction and figure, well, there's probably something important in that direction if I can go there. And in this corner of the map, you can kind of see what's down here. This is still developing. Both Jared and I do have um, quite a few aircraft in the air at this point. So we will certainly be finding more and more of each other here and I think in the turns to come, but um, so much of the equation, of course, is not just having the aircraft in the air, but trying to put them in a certain place at a certain time and <laughs> trying to have that ideal scenario where everything is kind of coming where you want it to be at the same time, um, which cannot be easy. It can be difficult to kind of arrange exactly the way that you want that to happen. Um, in the historical battle, of course, the Americans did have several different torpedo and bombing squadrons arriving uh, at the over the and finding the Japanese carriers at various times, but uh, it was quite spread out and not all at the same time. Um, for me, it's going to be a little bit easier, I think, for both Jared and I to accomplish that just because we have so much more control, so much more perfect control over uh, the units at our disposal than uh, the historical actors did. I'm sure if Admiral Spruance could have had a map like this where he could. Uh, <laughs> choose and move individual planes and aircraft to exactly where he wanted them at exactly the time he wanted to do that, uh, it probably would have been, uh, that would have been his dream and the, and the Japanese dream as well. So we always kind of have to keep in mind the fact that we've got uh, more more control at our disposal here than, than they did in real life. So I'm over here in this part of the map. I've found something uh, not quite able to do quite what I want to here yet. The, you can see when these targets show up, it's showing some uh, possible targets for me to shoot at. So um, it's not quite what I want to get at. I'm kind of aiming more towards things down here. So I'm going to probably hold off on that just for the moment. All right, so I'm zooming out here, just kind of show you again. So here's down in the kind of this, this corner of the map. Again, here's Midway Island for reference, and you're seeing sort of my units. And then over towards where I've got a few other potential sightings here, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in <laughs> exploring more of these areas to see what's out there. I have so far, I know on my last turn, I did spot, I think it was both the Kaga and Akagi. Um, and I think other than that, I had not spotted any other carriers. So obviously that's pretty high concern, knowing that there are more out there that I have not even 
uh, figured out where they are on the map yet. So that's that's another high priority job for me. All right, I'm going to call that a turn for me. I'm going to pass this over to Jared, and we'll go to this loading up screen, and it's passing it over to, to his turn now. Yeah, I think with um, the carriers starting to come more into play here, um, we had talked a little bit last time about, you know, one of uh, the American advantages, of course, is Midway Island itself and that it's kind of considered, you know, it is more or less an unsinkable aircraft carrier. It's one that can't move either, but um, it's, you know, the, uh, the number of aircraft on Midway Island that flew and got into the battle, even though not all of them necessarily were very effective, it was a potential tool. Um, Guy, there was one question I, I know I'd been thinking about and I wanted to ask you just in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, the riskiness of, of going into action the way that the Americans did. Um, we had talked last time about in terms of numbers of aircraft, um, the advantage actually was with the Americans a little bit. Um, but in terms of numbers of carriers, of course, it's, it's uh, just three aircraft carriers plus Midway Island and then the six Japanese carriers. So... I was curious about, I mean, your thoughts on how, how even recognizing, of course, that uh, the American intelligence picture was very good going into this, but how risky do you think that it was for the U.S. to go into this um, knowing they expected to meet four aircraft carriers? Um, there were even more than that, of course, but even if it had just been the four, that was still more than their three. Do you feel like that was, you know, how much risk do you think was involved in going up against that kind of on the short end of the stick when it comes to total numbers of carriers? Yeah, it was uh, definitely risky. And uh, Nimitz, uh, but, you know, Nimitz believed in the training of his men and, you know, and, and the men that ran the ships, Spruance and Fletcher, uh, the air commanders, um, he he really believed in these guys and and that they did want to hit back at the Japanese. And, uh, you know, with with the intelligence picture you had and, uh, you know, sort of knowing, you know, the there were factors that that were working against him, uh, the torpedoes, uh, the Mark 13 and, and 14 torpedoes that that uh, the U.S. had uh, were just absolutely horrible. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the U.S. aircraft was fairly obsolete uh, at that time. You you know, the Marines were still flying Brewster Buffaloes and and you know, very slow aircraft. The the torpedo bombers were notoriously slow, um, which allowed you know the Japanese Zeros to to really kind of come in and and. Uh, destroy those uh, three torpedo squadrons, um, but you, you know even even with that, uh, Nimitz still uh, believed that he held the the advantage and he, that he had the edge, and it ultimately uh, worked out. But definitely risky, definitely risky. Yeah, and uh, so you're everybody who's watching, you're looking at uh, Jared's moves now as he goes. And Jared, do you want to, again, without uh, giving away too much of what you're doing, of course, do you want to talk a little bit about um, what uh, <laughs> what's going on in your turn here and what you're trying to achieve? Sure. So uh, this is the force that uh, I said last game I had put here for a very specific purpose. And uh, up to this point, it really hasn't achieved anything <laughs> and uh based on the fact that i'm not really running into any units up here it's probably uh, not going to achieve anything at this rate um uh, kind of amazed that he hasn't stumbled across this yet to be honest <laughs> but uh, even if it doesn't do what i put it there to do it is at least you know playing a, a sort of a reconnaissance role for me you haven't stumbled into me that means i haven't stumbled into you so uh, i guess that's true <laughs> if we we both have some advantage and that we're both uh, partially hidden still 
Now, this is where things start to get a little bit messy because I'm trying to you know, keep my formation intact, but the ships are uh, kind of turning in the wrong direction. <laughs> Yeah, we had said last time, I know it's a, it's a, an artifact of working on a map that has a hex grid like this. So it does kind of force all the ships and aircraft to be pointing in just one of six directions. So it can sometimes, uh, <laughs> you end up with a bit of a, a wonky formation where you've got a, a sort of a star-shaped thing with ships pointing every which way. But uh, eventually, I think it usually gets itself worked out. When they started playing these games uh, at the War College, um, the, early on uh, when they were using maps like this, they actually used maps with squares and there were only four directions you could have gone in. And the reason that we have hex maps like this uh, today is that um, they eventually figured out um, that the square map really distorted movement even more than a hex map did. And, and they, it especially came into a play if you ever wanted to do something where you were trying to move kind of diagonally on the map um <clears throat> say pointing north and you're trying to go northwest that's really not a very far move it shouldn't take you more to go northwest than it would to say due west but because of a square it would take you two moves to get northwest whereas it would just one move to go west so they realized eventually that um having a hex grid like this gave you two more movement options and, and actually made movement a little bit more realistic so um the, some of the games of the college today still do use hex maps like this. Um, obviously, a lot of them are computerized where uh, they're not even, you know, they don't even have an artificial hex grid over the map. You can just kind of move wherever. But sometimes for ease of play, um, they still use games like this. So even though this particular game isn't used at the college, it is pretty similar to ones that you could find there. Rob, that was actually my question. I was going to ask you in, at this time, like when, when they were practicing what those games were like. I mean, and they, they were like models, right? And well, they could be, although a, a lot of time, well, the, the ones with, uh, so every year, I think, as we said in the beginning, they, they did a game, a hypothetical scenario against Japan every year um, between the end of World War One and the start of World War Two. That was on the curriculum every single year, um, a, a, a scenario against Japan and a scenario against Great Britain. Um, just because Great Britain was still considered to be, you know, the preeminent navy in the world and the ones to to aspire to be like them. So, um, but yeah, the the ones against Japan were largely what they they kind of had two different types of games: a table maneuver, which would be the ones that you're talking about, where they would use model ships, and they were much more like tactical scenarios where you're focused on ship maneuvering and and you know the finer details of maneuvering uh, ships in combat. The ones against Japan were much more like the larger strategic scenarios where they called those chart maneuvers. And with those, since you're kind of really controlling whole fleets and you're looking at large strategic actions, for those purposes, it was enough just to be able to, uh, uh, to use a piece of chalk on the floor. And they would play these games in a huge like basketball court sized room at the college where they would just kind of draw lines on the floor to show where the fleets were going. And, the basketball court size room was big enough that you could you know basically show the entire pacific ocean in a room that size so it gave them the ability to do some uh, some much larger scenarios but yeah at that scale um, you didn't even need models to do that the the sad thing for us and so i'm, I'm going to click through here every turn you'll see a replay of uh, because this game is meant to be kind of played by email so it shows you a replay you and the audience have already seen this, and so you were just watching what Jared did. So I'm gonna kind of click through it here very quickly and get up to uh, where I can start moving. But I see he is uh, starting to soften up Midway Island a little bit there, Jared. It looks like you've got the right idea. <laughs> yeah, I did an experiment with uh, uh, the, one of the test games, and I figured out that if you bomb a hangar before the planes take off, it damages all the planes in it. And so based on what Rob was saying, I figured he had not launched yet. So I just went ahead and did it. <laughs> that was some uh, free intelligence for me on your part, I guess. <laughs> All right. So now we're well, I, I had that playing uh, I had that playing part there for like three turns, so I didn't see anything leave. 
Yeah, I definitely noticed that it was just hanging out there watching. I had a spy in the sky there, so I, I figured if I did take off, it was going to get uh, <laughs> ambushed by you as soon as I took off. So you're, you're kind of forcing the issue now, I guess. All right, so I've got something going on over at... Ah, here we go. All right, so... Now we've got some more carriers on the board that I'm starting to spot. So that's that's kind of what I wanted. I was hoping to see something over here. And now I'm gonna see what's what's going on. All right. Now we got a little bit clearer picture. So looks like uh, you'll see this in your turn, Jared. So it's okay, I think, to <laughs> to show what I'm looking at here. Okay. Got a few other spotter aircraft that are still up in the air, but I'm at this point, I think I'm just trying to figure out, do I want to try and hunt down all of the Japanese carriers or do I just want to kind of focus on the ones that I know I've seen already and work up a plan to uh, do something against them. But since you're already bombing Midway, that's going to kind of force the issue up there too. I want to make sure that, uh, oh, yes, here we go. I want to make sure I'm never uh, leaving Midway to its own devices for too long. Yeah, we haven't had really any action uh, on all of the map yet, and and maybe I'm I'm I know Jared, you were saying there was one group of yours that really hadn't done anything because it hadn't found anything yet, and we're probably talking about the same area of the map because I have a, a few ships <laughs> in this part of the map that haven't really seen anything either, so. We may be finding that we're not quite sticking to the historical script in that regard, which is okay. That's part of why we're playing. We talked a little bit last week about uh, some of the uh, constraints that the game places on the players for the Japanese player that's having to start the transports way out, which keeps you from uh, assembling in a formation early. One of the constraints that Rob has is that if the Japanese come at midway in force, he can't hide off to the east and try to fight them off with carrier attacks. He has to bring at least some of his surface fleet up to support midway. All right, and I'm moving some units in this part of the map here that I'm if you're watching, you can basically see what's going on, but I don't wanna don't wanna say too much about it <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I'll let uh, I'll let the picture speak for itself. Rob, I know you set this uh, sort of customized a little bit for the scenario, but did you give yourself F-18s? Is that what I'm seeing right there? <laughs> no, this is not the final countdown. There's no F-14s or anything like that in it. Good, um, but <laughs> Good reference. Thank you. <laughs> Had to throw that in there. No, uh, yeah, you can uh, I'll zoom in on uh, some of the American aircraft because so you can see what we've got. I know we were talking about the uh, the torpedo bombers, the, the Devastator uh, torpedo bomber aircraft last time, which... Um, or that's what uh, what we've got with the American carriers here. So um, I'm going to, let's see, I think I'm going to kick this over. So speaking of aircraft, Mark, um, I know there's an aircraft in your collection that you wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, do you want to go ahead and do that right now? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So Jared, I'm going to kick this over to Mark's screen. But if you want to go ahead and, and move and then kind of uh, bring us up to speed with what you did uh, when, when Mark is done, we can do it that way. That'll work. Yeah, right. so Rob, earlier, uh, you have my screen up, yeah? Yep, there you go. You're up. Great, great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so you were asking earlier about any aircraft we might have had that had been at Midway. And in fact, there's only one survivor um, uh, aircraft from Midway, and we do have it. And it's an SBD, uh, Bureau number 2106. So Bureau number is the uh, unique identifier for, for Navy aircraft as they were numbering them as they were manufactured. And initially, um, 2106. I uh, was assigned to VB2 aboard the USS Lexington. Um, 
it had uh, its squadron mates had left and it actually stayed behind at a repair facility on uh, Ford Island. And there it sat when actually the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor commenced two days uh, after the USS Lexington had left. But it actually survived the attack on Pearl Harbor. And I'm gonna go over here. This is a aircraft history card. And this basically details uh, where the aircraft were, what happened to it, and eventually if it um, left the fleet, which is what stricken means. We'll get to that in a minute. But you can see here um, that it was VB2 and the Lexington. It was at Pearl Harbor. Um, and then later it got assigned um, to VB3. Uh, later, um, and you can see where it says war here as well. You can see how it was uh, also assigned to the Marine Bombing uh, Squad and Scout Squad 241 uh, in May. And of course, the, um, a little bit later, it actually participates in the Battle of Midway. And its pilot, Lieutenant Daniel Iverson, and his backseater, Wallace Reed, actually uh, boarded 2106, and they launched with 15 other SPDs to attack the Japanese carriers that were approaching Midway uh, during the battle. They actually made a diving run against the carrier Hiryu, um, and they took heavy anti-aircraft fire and then were pursued by Japanese Zeros um, after the run. Now, they, they had got hit quite a few times. Uh, their hydraulics were knocked out. Reed, the backseater, was wounded, and a bullet had come so close uh, to Iverson that it actually clipped his throat microphone cord, which is right, right against his throat there. So it was a very close call for him. Iverson uh, proceeds to make a one-wheel landing at Midway, and when he finally exited the aircraft, he learned that more than 200 bullet holes had peppered his aircraft. So it was, it was quite a harrowing flight. Um, a year later, uh, 2106 actually gets taken back to Lake Michigan aboard the training aircraft carriers uh, for carrier qualifications. And almost, uh, a, almost exactly a year after it fought in Midway, um, a student actually put it in Lake Michigan and it sank to the bottom. <laughs> and it would stay there for 60 years. Uh, we were talking about this before, um, at least that the waters in Lake Michigan are fresh and cold. So it was, it was, um, it was preserved pretty well, and we eventually found where it was, uh, and we pulled it out of the lake. And this is what it looks like as it's being pulled out. Um, so for 60 years underwater, not terrible condition. Um, you can see where it had Midway uh, still stamped on it among some of the uh, underwater corrosion there. And it, um, our team, our restoration team, spent a good uh, seven years of work on this aircraft uh, once it was pulled out. And it is currently on display like this um, in our museum. We've left a couple spots with the original paint, which are on the other side. But um, it's, it's, it's a testament to not only the dedication of our volunteers, but, um, you know, one of those reasons that our museum is there is to really preserve these aircraft that have a lot of provenance or history behind them. And as I said, this is the only known surviving aircraft that had fought at Midway. Yeah, that is amazing. That is so awesome. <laughs> Are we allowed to ask roughly where in Lake Michigan it was found? <laughs> uh, you know, that's an excellent question. I don't know the coordinates, but um, I, I can't imagine it was too far off Glenview, which is where, where it was stationed. Um, yeah. But I'll, uh, I'll look that up and I'll, I'll attach it to a comment and I'll see what we can okay. find out. Yeah. That's a good, and that's a good point. Uh, unlike the Air Force, the Navy maintained those aircraft history cards I showed you. They actually maintain the title. The Navy maintains the title. So even if you come across one, um, it's still Navy property. And so you contact the Navy and figure out what they want to do. Um, so that is that is an important point. That is something that the Navy takes um, great pains to make sure that uh, they, if, if an aircraft is discovered, that they 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 talk it over and and see what they can do about it. So. Yeah, that is just an amazing restoration job looking at that and seven years of hard work that yeah, yeah, <laughs> was sure. it most like an all volunteer team that did that or did you have a lot of staff helping too? No, uh, I mean, there's a couple of staff that supervise and, and, and sort of run the volunteers, but a lot of these volunteers are former uh, mechanics, aviation mates uh, mm -hmm. uh, that come back when they've retired. And, and so they have a lot of skill um, and they have a lot of uh, knowledge to, to help with this. Um, yeah. We actually have in the, in the archive, we actually have technical manuals. Uh, for every aircraft. And so from those, you can know which pieces need to go where. Um, there's even wiring diagrams. Ours don't fly, but it could um, if we use those. But um, we have technical manuals run by retired uh, Master Chief, Frank Turchie, who who uh, provides all that information for them. And that includes markings, um, the, the whole nine yards. Yeah, very nice. 
Cool. Yeah. No. Thanks a lot for sharing. That yeah. uh, that is a, a highlight of any museum's collection. There for sure. I, <laughs> I wish we our museum was big enough to have aircraft. Unfortunately, we are far too small to host <laughs> any uh, macro artifact like that. But um, yeah, 110 aircraft take up a lot of space. They do. <laughs> Helps to have hangars available to you. <laughs> All right, Jared, I'm gonna switch the screen back to, to you here. So do you want to uh, kind of quickly give us a, an update on what you've been doing in very general terms so you don't give anything away to me? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the first thing I did was I finished off both the uh, hangar and the shore battery on Midway. So uh -oh. uh, Midway <laughs> has nothing left uh, to contest the invasion. Uh, I'm kind of surprised there were no, uh, no fighters uh, over Midway yet. I know that uh, they could have made it by now uh, if they had deployed. Uh, so that was kind of a, a couple of free hits. And hopefully uh, that completely eliminated the uh, air group on Midway. So uh, our actual numbers of carrier planes at this point should be fairly even. And it looks like he spotted my uh, second task force. Uh, I talked last week about how I had done something uh, more like what the Americans were expecting the Japanese to do and something that they did uh, pretty frequently throughout the war where they operated uh, parts of their fleet in uh, various components. And then they would be uh, trying to meet up uh, to accomplish some sort of overarching strategic objective. Uh, I did, uh, you know, kind of this this opposite deployment where I had one force coming up from the south and then one in the center, and uh, you can, you know, see if, if I click on them, I had car uh, carriers Akagi and Kaga up in one unit. They operated as a single division. Then down here I had uh, Hiryu and Soryu, uh, which of course were half sisters basically. And uh, we're also the two uh, fastest carriers, uh, the four uh, fleet carriers that participated in the battle. And then also I had one uh, one light carrier down here somewhere. There it is, uh, Ryuji. But uh, the reason I did that is it, it's probably something similar to what I actually would have done. I uh, I probably would have split the carriers up and had the, the two slower carriers operating together and then the two faster carriers operating together. And it looks like I've just about moved everything. And I can see Rob is bringing a big chunk of his force up to Midway. <laughs> Yeah, I think they're going to need help there if you've basically bombed the shore establishment into oblivion. So we <laughs> have to improvise a little bit here if we don't want uh, Japanese troops on Midway Island. All right, Rob, back to you. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, let's see who's still standing here. So I'm just clicking through the replay again of, let's see. Oh, yeah. So we have quite a swarm of <laughs> Japanese aircraft over the island. Yeah, it looks like the hangar is definitely gone. I did think that shore battery there was going to last uh, longer than it did because it would also was uh, these sandbags kind of show that everything gets dug in uh, over over if it doesn't move every turn you get a little bit more protection just kind of show that they would be you know digging in and building up the defenses a little more so uh, did not really help them against the aircraft though. All right, I'll click through the rest of this. 
You, you might want to double check that, Rob, because it seems like I, I saw it as I was clicking off and it had maybe one strength left. No, is it double just check that? Okay. Well, if it is, apparently it's not going to last much longer. We'll see. All right. Let's see. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's got one strength point left. So those guys better, better duck. <laughs> But I know you've at least spotted uh, the guys who are here trying to be in a position to help them or, or would have helped them if uh, they were still alive. But it looks like it might be up to the Navy to defend Midway Island at this time, at this point. So I definitely want to bring up as much help as I can for that right now. Um, I don't want to lose track of my submarines either. I know we've both been sort of relying on submarines to be the, the early warning and the, the eyes of the fleet. Um, I know for me, I've, I've tried to use them that way. Um, they're not, of course, as fast, even on the surface. They're not going to be as fast as your ship. So the problem is once they spot things, they tend to lose them if they don't uh, cruise around pretty quickly. So I'm going to see if I can at least get them in position to help me a little bit more on some future turns here. So there are some ships out here. So these are transport ships here that I know are the ones that are carrying the invasion fleet, for the, um, the, the troops who might want to land on the island. So obviously, if I can sink those at sea, that will solve my problem of how to defend Midway Island. Um, and I think I'm going to bring uh, B-17 over here that... Uh, going to probably take you know, some anti-aircraft fire, but I'm going to get him going on trying to do some damage to those ships. And of course, as you can see, <laughs> pretty historically accurate here. They did not, I don't think they got any hits there. So, and that's probably going to be the case for them most of the game. They are much better as a kind of a scouting role than, than a bombing role. So uh, I'm going to have to realize that that's a limitation for them. But um, if I can get some Navy aircraft in there to uh, do the job instead, that's going to be, that'll go much better for me, I think. The Navy will have to come in and clean up the Army's mess. So I'm back down on this corner of the map. Um, Midway Island is... Uh, kind of up there again in the center. You can kind of see the direction that I'm maneuvering in here. Don't want to leave this group completely <laughs> defenseless. I, I want to keep some aircraft kind of around all my groups here um, to at least uh, ward off some of those fighters and bombers that are probably coming in here. Um, I guess I have to feel pretty good about this point, unless uh, I haven't noticed something, Jared. I don't believe you spotted any of my carriers yet. Um, and if that's the case, then I feel like that's still an advantage. I'm trying to hold on to that just as long as I possibly can. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing uh, AJ Orlikoff uh, commenting here. So AJ was one of our opponents from our previous game when we played the Hampton Roads Naval Museum and the National Museum of the US Army in, in one of these games. So. AJ, glad to have you watching here tonight. Uh, I do want to ask, and I know AJ will do this because we had fun with this last time too, to uh, please chime in here with comments and suggestions. So um, if you're looking at the, uh, the screen, you can kind of see what's shaping up here. Um, and I'd be curious about which group of Japanese ships do you think I should attack? Um, I'm kind of looking at this group here for one. And if I zoom up here, we know this group where there's some spottings, but this group has a lot of transport ships in it that are carrying uh, troops that might invade Midway Island. So um, I'd be interested to hear folks' thoughts on uh, what they think should be the target of an American airstrike, should it be in the air. I'm not saying that it is, I'm just saying it might be. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that.
What took you guys so long? <laughs> They're taking their time, but um, unlike, I think, uh, the actual <laughs> performance of the three carriers, I mean, I'm again lucky that I'm, I'm, I'm having a much easier time coordinating their actions. And of course, we talked a little bit about the infamous flight to nowhere last time with USS Hornet. I do not have to deal with any of these units uh, not following my orders that I give them. <laughs> that, that is obviously uh, something you sort of take for granted in a computer game, that units just do what you want them to do. There are some games where that is not necessarily the case. Uh, this game doesn't have anything quite like that. So um, in that regard, I do have it easier uh, <laughs> than Spruance and Nimitz did. Uh, all right, I think I'm good for my turn. Uh, I'm going to pass it back over to you, Jared. Since we were talking about the uh, American carriers there real quick, um, I'm going to pop in here real quick. And Jared, I'm going to switch it over to my screen again here. Um, we at the War College Museum don't have nearly the great aviation-related artifacts that the National Naval Aviation Museum does, of course, um, but we do have just a couple of things related to Midway, and I wanted to show um, one kind of neat thing that we do have here, if I can get it up on my screen. Uh, here we go. Um, so we happen to have a fairly mundane piece of equipment, but this no smoking sign that came off of USS Enterprise. Um, I don't have a particular, uh, I don't have any information about this sign, so unfortunately I can't tell you where on the carrier it came from. Um, I really don't have anything else about it, just that it was a piece from the ship. Um, sometimes pieces like these, I don't know about you, Mark, I know, I feel like sometimes the, the mundane pieces that are sort of related to just everyday life on the ship can be the most interesting sometimes, just um, because it's fun to sort of imagine, you know, I, I can sort of see, uh, you know, uh, everybody on the ship, the, you know, Halsey at one time, or Spruance later on, um, you know, um, Fletcher coming by, walking by this and being stressed out about how things were going and thinking like, oh man, I could really use a cigarette. I'm like, oh no, wait, I can't shoot. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's one of these things that are just related to the, the kind of the daily routines on the ship, not necessarily related to the Battle of Midway, but um, just kind of, uh, uh, illuminate the kind of the just the the day-to-day -day life on board the ship so those can be kind of neat to show but uh, this is really the only piece in our collection that is kind of has a direct connection to Midway but I just wanted to throw that out there not as great as an aircraft that you pulled out of Lake Michigan admittedly but <laughs> this is this is what we have no but I mean, Rob you're, you're right on right because this is the daily life this was the majority of the war right it's not battles 24 7 it's a lot of waiting and then there's that climax and then there's more waiting you know, so that daily life is really what that sailor's life was like so reminders of that or those objects yeah absolutely i mean that that's what a lot a lot of the the veteran the people that served could certainly identify with so yeah i agree with you 100 percent it's kind of like all the letters we get that they and you have to wonder if Oh yeah, go ahead, guy. It's gonna oh no, like I was just gonna like say. I mean, <laughs> it makes me wonder if the no smoking sign was from you know the hangar deck or somewhere where there were you know a lot of uh, munitions stored or something, um, because you know back back then even the pilots were were smoking in the ready room and and all that. So so that's actually uh, pretty nice to see. Gives you just that reminder of uh, what those guys dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, it's like the letters that we get, right, in the archive. I mean, somebody who writes the whole, their whole entire wartime service, a lot of it is, you know, this happened or we were waiting, you know, and then, then there'll be a letter about the battle, you're right? Um, but then it's back to, you know, I really miss you, I miss the family, so is that daily sort of grind, yeah, so for sure. All right, so you can see me using my uh, attack aircraft to go after the uh, destroyers in the screen up north. So they did a pretty good job. Hope my anti aircraft fire uh, has uh, some effect there, but we'll see.
Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if it was this way for you, Jared. I mean, the tough thing for me here is because this map, there's so much open ocean and open space that you're tempted to really spread out to try to search as much of the map as quickly as possible. But the more you spread out, I mean, you lose the, obviously the protection of a formation. And even though our formations are kind of simplified in here, again, because of what we were saying about the hex grid kind of limits what you can do with fancy formations. But just having ships next to each other, um, you'll see as of your watch, um, when, when I try to attack his ships or he tries to attack mine, you'll see the nearby ships contribute their own anti-aircraft fire to the ship that's actually being attacked. So there is a lot of benefit in keeping your ships together. But as you do that, of course, you lose some ability to kind of uh, explore the other parts of the map and, and try and find uh, ships you might be looking for. I have a feeling with just one point left that uh, coastal gun on Midway is probably no more at this point, but I will find out soon enough. Yeah, I, I took him out with a cruiser. Okay, yeah, and save me the suspense. <laughs> uh, let's see, I'm gonna leave this guy up here. And bring that guy back over here. I won't ask you to divulge, obviously, your exact plan yet, Jared, but I would be interested because we're almost at like the halfway point here of the game. Have you had to alter your initial plan based on anything that's happened so far, or, or is things pretty much progressing as you would like? I think at this point it's gone pretty much like I thought it would, other than that one group, uh, you know, not really doing anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I haven't really had to change any of my formations too much. And now that I know that Rob is you know, kind of moving in toward midway, I'm trying to be a little more aggressive with my scouting than I was earlier in the game. You can see the other thing that's happened is that now that I'm closer to Medway, my two fleets are uh, starting to converge. Yeah, just like how I was saying, oh, yeah, it's it's I don't have to worry about <laughs> torpedo squadrons uh, or anything from Hornet uh, mutinying and flying off on their own or, or getting lost or anything like that. <laughs> Likewise, you, Jared, uh, it's okay to have a complex plan with multiple converging elements and i'm sure you're you're finding it a lot easier to bring those elements together uh, uh than the japanese did in reality yeah absolutely If we were going to play this really like they do the games at the college, we'd also have a time limit going here. Um, even in the early days, like in back in World War One and, and in the interwar period, they always uh, gave the students a very limited amount of time to write their orders. And they would actually have to write them down on a piece of paper and hand them in um, and kind of format them the way that you would in reality. So they, they tried to uh, build a little bit, you know, have them experience just a little bit of the pressure that they would if they were actually in command in a situation like this. Um, we don't have time limits going here, but uh, I suppose if we need to, I can always find an egg timer and just flip it and <laughs> say go. <laughs> but we are, uh, we have the luxury of having a little bit more relaxed environment, I would say, than, than the students did in reality. Well, it seems to me you guys are moving along pretty good knowing your plan and just, I mean, you guys are Pretty good with these controls, you know. <laughs> All right, Rob, back to you. Okay. 
Hey, we've talked a little bit about different simulations for these things. I was wondering maybe Guy yeah, could talk a little bit about fleet problems. Uh, sure. Um, yeah. I, well, I mean, uh, Rob kind of touched on it uh, pretty good. I mean, uh, you know, the uh, in the interwar years, uh, you know, the fleet problems, a lot of them, uh, you know, they had a red, a blue team. Um, the Japanese very much had uh, the same thing. In fact, the Japanese sort of uh, had a, a war game um, back in uh, – uh, trying to remember the year. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm blanking right now. Uh, I think it was 1914 uh, where they pretty much had a scenario much the same, um, you know, with uh, with everything they had going on with, with Midway. In fact, uh, uh, before the, the battle, um, around the time after uh, Coral Sea, uh, there was a red team and a blue team and the uh, Japanese team that were playing as the U S um, basically put the uh, American carriers in almost the exact same spot where uh, Nimitz had, had told Fletcher and, and Spruance uh, to set up the ambush and uh, the uh, person refereeing uh, the game was uh he, he was like, oh, you can't do that. The Americans would never be there. So that's just, uh, and he threw out that turn, essentially. And uh, the uh, Japanese uh, officer that uh, was playing the Americans was uh, extremely upset about that. And the ironic thing is that's almost exactly uh, the scenario that, that played out. Um, but the, the Americans... Uh, played the same uh, with the uh, fleet problems. Um, there were, you know, different teams, different scenarios. Uh, there was a lot of uh, problems that went on between uh, California, Hawaii, and uh, just different scenarios, uh, you know, trying to, trying to predict uh, what would happen uh, during a, a war with Japan. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, there were also fleet problems in the Atlantic. Um, and, and it was just, uh, you know, setting up because they knew one day this was probably going to come to pass, especially with uh, against the Japanese. So it was a very important thing uh, that these fleet problems went on. And, and they went on pretty much every year. Uh, there were... Uh, there were a few years that, that they didn't occur uh, just due to different circumstances, but pretty much all the way up until the beginning of World War II from the 20s, uh, just after World War I until uh, the beginning of World War II, uh, the U.S. Navy uh, competed in these fleet problems. And they would have referees that would call, right, like hits or something like that, isn't that? <laughs> Or, or how, uh, how would the these inner, inner, like you said, the ones that, oh, that turned out the count, but how would. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I'm not exactly sure how they, how they exactly played out. I'd have to look that up and, and get back to you on that. Um, but that, yeah, that would be uh, interesting to find out. But yeah, uh, just within the, um, there were actual fleet problems where, you know, the ships were actually out doing maneuvers, sort of like workups and, and things like that. Um, but the actual table games and things, things uh, that the way they would play the scenarios that way, I do believe they had uh, referees on hand uh, just to sort of check the work, uh, you know, and, and see if uh, the scenario was realistic or, you know, if it was something, you know. But but that was the thing with the Japanese. They, they had uh, run so rampant in the six months after Pearl Harbor and they just uh, they fell victim to their own uh, what they termed the victory disease. And uh, right. Jared, I'm kicking it over to you. Sorry, guy. Oh no, you're fine. I'm sorry. I mean to keep going on and on. <laughs> but I, I was oh, just okay. saying that the, the Japanese uh, that that war game that they they played out where uh, you know they they didn't believe the scenario could could happen. And the way they did, I think, showed 
a lot of the arrogance that that was sort of running through the uh, the high, you know, ranking uh, Imperial Navy at the time. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. I had wanted to mention that too, just because it's a great wargaming story associated with Midway, an actual war game, as you said, that the Japanese conducted. Yeah, this was uh, May, it was early May, the first week of May, I'm just about a month before um, Midway. And um, yeah, Admiral Yamamoto had uh, wanted to basically rehearse the Midway operation with all the principal commanders that we part of this. So he hosted this game on board his flagship Yamato and brought everybody there. Yeah, and you're right. There, this, there's there a couple kind of infamous incidents that come out of that game. And one of them you, you mentioned where the, they did have some Japanese officers controlling the American side. Unfortunately, I, I have never been able to find out names of who it was controlling the Americans. I think that's lost to history, unfortunately. But but yeah, you're, the one thing that you mentioned about how they, they basically he brought the American carriers just the way they did in reality. And, and Admiral Ugaki is the one who is the, uh, Yamamoto's chief of staff. He was running the game and he basically overruled it. Um, the other kind of infamous incident that comes out of this um, that people sometimes point to as, as evidence of Japanese arrogance involves the bombers, which uh, I had the B-17s up here, which um, I wanted to kind of tie this into that. But during the game, the American player um, flew the land-based aircraft um, that they had on Midway Island um, and spotted the Japanese fleet and bombed them. And the way that the Japanese ran their games, they used dice to actually figure out, you know, what happened when you attacked. And so the umpire rolled the dice. Um, and according to the one eyewitness account we have of this, um, it resulted in nine hits, which was enough to sink two Japanese aircraft carriers. Admiral Ugaki was completely taken aback by that and, and sort of similar to the other stories, you know, that there's no way the Americans could ever sink two aircraft carriers. He did allow, so he reduced it unilaterally to just three hits, which was enough to still sink one of them, but um, the other one was just damaged. Um, and uh, and a lot of people point to that as, 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 again, a sign of, you know, that in fact, you know, American aircraft did wreak havoc on the Japanese carriers and that should have been a sign to them. Um, the two things I would say to that are, are, first of all, the aircraft involved in this, again, were the land-based aircraft coming out of Midway Island. And in reality, that would have meant that they were the B-17s flying off of there. Um, and as we've seen, uh, and as we know from the battle, the B-17s did horribly when they were attacking uh, aircraft, or attacking ships, sorry. They could not hit maneuvering ships at sea um, uh, at all. It was not what they were designed to do. They didn't have the equipment to do that. So. Uh, it just was not the role they had been made to do. So in that sense, I think you could kind of forgive <laughs> Ugaki for, for overruling that, even though, you know, his reasons may have been different. But it's not, I think, you know, an unrealistic uh, decision for him to have made to say that, you know, that was a lucky roll of the dice. But, you know, in terms of what is more likely to happen, it seemed like it would be more likely that those bombers, you know, would not have much of an effect on the battle. The other key thing I think to keep in mind too is is how do we how, where does that story come from you know what's our source for that um, and we really only have one good source for that story one of the participants which is um, Captain Mitsuo Fukaida who's most well known for being the leader of the air attack on Pearl Harbor uh, but he wrote a memoir after the war and, and uh, became um, very much kind of a devotee of Western culture after the war and, and um, wrote for American audiences. But he wrote a book talking about this, and that's where he explains this. But um, unfortunately, parts of his book, several parts of it, have been found to be inaccurate over the years, where he kind of was trying to make himself more central to some events than he was and, and um, kind of I think right in the 50s, he was kind of trying to impress an American audience a little bit too, knowing that he kind of wanted to sell his books to us. So <laughs> perhaps, uh, you know, saying that um, it, it would have benefited him to have stories like that to show that, you know, yes, the Japanese were so overconfident and arrogant, but you Americans really showed us in the battle. <laughs> so, so I feel like for several of those reasons, we kind of have to take that story with a grain of salt. Uh, and, you know, it could well be true, but I feel like the source is suspect enough. I kind of handle that story with a little bit of suspicion. So I don't know if you feel the same way, Guy, or if, you, if you've come across that or if you've read his book, but that's um, it's still a neat story to bring in just because it is a, a wargaming connection with the Battle of Midway. Right. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's uh, it's become suspect over over the decades. Yeah, so taking it with a grain of salt is uh, probably the yeah. best course. Yeah, I kind of like the whole thing with the dice, though, just because like, for people who play <laughs> games, the uh, one of the cardinal rules I think of any war game is you know you're, you're never supposed to blame the dice. You know, it's like if 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 you lose a game because of a bad die roll, then you're supposed to say, well, you know, what are all the decisions that I made that brought the game down to that one die roll, right? What could I have done differently so that it didn't all depend on that one die roll? But I just think it's so funny that, you know, if this story is true, I mean, it's essentially an example of the Japanese high command blaming the dice. <laughs> it's like, hey, we all know you're not supposed to do that. So, um, but uh yeah, I, I regret that, you know, uh, sometimes we get asked about um, if the rules for that game have survived, if, if you know, we, we know, you know, can actually see the game they were playing that where that happened or, you know, any of those dice survived. And unfortunately, you know, to my knowledge, at least none of those things did survive the war. So I, I would love to be able to, you know, read the rules and actually see what, how their games modeled what they thought, you know, naval mm -hmm. combat like and and, and uh, you know I think so much of the criticism for that point of the war again is that um, with Ugaki making all these overruling the umpires they really just wanted these games to validate what they already knew they wanted to do and you know that really that's not what a game is supposed to be obviously it's supposed to be a tool you use to find the errors in your plan and what you can do differently but at that point in the war, you know, they clearly were feeling like they had things going pretty well. They had met with almost nothing but success up to that point. So it seems pretty clear, even if that story is not exactly true, it does seem to be the case that their war games probably weren't serving them very well at that point when they, they really just were treating them as a formality rather than a real training exercise. And it makes me wonder also, because Yamamoto's plans were often so convoluted, uh, you know, just uh, were the war games, you know, did they mirror his convoluted plans or mm -hmm. strategies or, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Be pretty good to look into that more. Yeah, I, I, at least in Fukaida's account, I think he even says that the when the, the player playing the American side wanted to move his carriers to the north of Midway uh, and approach on the flank un, un, unannounced and unsuspected. And then when Ugaki overruled him on that, he was, according to Fukade, said he was, this player was in tears because right. he felt like, he, this was, <laughs> like he, had, he had had this great plan that he thought would be, you know, really useful to show this could be right. something that could happen. And, and, he was he moved to tears by the fact that uh, they weren't going to let him do it in the game. So mm -hmm. the one yeah. thing I guess you can say in their defense is that Yamamoto did insist after all this game was over that that they keep at least uh, part of their aircraft ready and armed with anti-ship weapons and not devote their entire uh, air capability to, to the anti-ground mission to strike midway. And that right. did come about partly because of these things that happened in the game. So, so there is... I guess you can give them credit for that much, at least. <laughs> I'm uh, throwing it back to you now, Rob. Okay. Rob, your, your comment about the dice is funny. I, I actually don't play many video games, but I do play strategy tabletop war games that use dice. And um, modern players have no compunction about blaming the dice when things go <laughs> <laughs> It's hard not to, yeah, when you, uh, <laughs> when you just get an unlucky roll. That's uh, it's a lot of the games uh, that the college used, again, kind of talking about the interwar period, actually did not use dice at all, um, partly for kind of the reasons that we're talking about, to, to avoid the situation where you just get a very unlikely result that kind of skews the game in one direction or another. Um, so I, let's see, I, it looks like an American destroyer has gone under there. So that's... Uh, you're starting to pick away at my guard force and midway there, Jared. <laughs> but um, but yeah, the lot they they decided to have a lot of their games not use dice specifically, so that they would sort of just use. They kind of figured out what average results would be, you know, if you're shooting at a certain ship from a certain range, um, at a certain time of day with weather conditions, then you could expect to get you know X number of hits, and so they didn't 
randomize it. They didn't roll in dice. They just, you know, had that as a sort of a fixed result. Um, that made the games go uh, quicker too. A lot of these games, obviously, when you're playing with an entire class at the War College, you're talking about potentially dozens of players all being uh, playing this at the same time. So if you just stop and roll dice all the time, that slows things down a lot too. So there are good reasons to not use dice. Um, and, and again, just for playability's sake and, and for, you could say for realism's sake, it just it kind of lets you work with average results, which is probably more useful for planning than if you, uh, you know, have a, you know, what, what you might call a critical hit or a critical, <laughs> critical event that um, wouldn't be likely to happen in reality, but does in your game and then kind of throws everything off from there. All right, let's see what we got going on now. So, yeah, I definitely see uh, my ships in the middle right by Midway Island are starting to take it on the chin. But I think we are closing on each other here where we're definitely going <laughs> to have some gunnery duels starting out here, if not uh, actual airstrikes. Well, it's time for me to start doing some shooting. So I'm going to start working on a few targets that I've spotted here. Um, obviously, with nobody left defending Midway, again, I'm, I'm pretty much reliant on the Navy to keep <laughs> to keep Japanese ships away from there. So I'm not sure how long these guys are going to be able to hold out. So we're on turn nine here. And um, guys, I'm thinking since this is sort of the end of the turn, I'm probably after I finish my move here, probably this is going to be a good place to end it because I can see we're not going to finish here within the next few minutes. We've got a few turns left to go. So I think we will probably plan on doing one more session. Um, but let's see. I think we may as well see what we've got. To, well, no, here, I'm going to. Do something a little bit different. All right. Well, the gunnery duel has begun here. We, we've got uh, we've got um, Jared. This is certainly the Japanese dream, I guess, to have um, ships within gun range of their their heavier ships, but they had, had certainly were hoping that their aircraft and submarines could kind of weaken the Americans before uh, finishing them off with their their uh, battleships and cruisers. And it looks like you may have that in the works here. So I guess in that regard, you can definitely say that you're doing better <laughs> better than in reality. Let's see here. I'm not one to count my cruisers before they're sunk. <laughs> my Carriers are still kind of playing the cat and mouse game here. These submarines we're talking about again here, I'm, you can see what I'm doing with them here. I'm, they've definitely provided me some useful information, uh, but I'm, I think I'm kind of in the same boat that Jared is, that I'm kind of consolidating things here. I mean, as the game progresses and we're sort of focused on Midway, I, I guess it's all kind of coalescing around attacking Midway for Jared and defending it for me. All right, but yeah, things are... <laughs> heating up quite a bit here. All right, so I have I think I've done everything I want to do on my turn. That gets us through turn nine. So when we start again, um, we'll have, we'll be at the start of turn 10. We'll have about six turns to go. Um, we'll probably, I don't think it's even going to go that long because I think we'll probably have a, a result <laughs> before we get to the very end. 
um, depending on whether uh, the Japanese land on Midway or not. But we'll see how we'll do here. So guys, I think I will, I'm gonna hit end turn, but um, why don't we call it good there for tonight? So, um, well, we definitely got uh, got into the shooting match now, Jared. So we've got um, aircraft in the air on both sides and we've got uh, surface ships firing at each other. I've got a few hits with my submarines. I don't think I've encountered your submarines yet though, Jared. So I guess I'm I've, uh, I can at least count that, too, that I, I've snuck by them. But not having very many to begin with, I know it wasn't too likely they would find anything in my way. But we're, we're definitely starting to get all of the uh, the uh, the various elements of the uh, subsurface surface and, and aircraft involved here. Um, Guy, do you have any like general observations in terms of, uh, I don't know if it's easy to follow what's going on, but uh, how we're doing uh, compared to the, the historical battle as it unfolded? Yeah, I think uh, it almost looked like Jared was trying to do maybe somewhat of a pincer movement uh, with a couple of his groups there. Um, I'm not sure if that is what he intended, maybe not. Um, but uh, yeah, and and it's interesting that uh, you know you were sort of forced to um, sort of bring your, your ships in closer to midway. And I don't know if that's just because of the, the scale of the game. It seems like, uh, maybe your air groups aren't, aren't really launching attacks, uh, you know, sort of, uh, as a historical, the historically, you know, the, the Americans launched a lot of piecemeal and uncoordinated attacks, uh, which was unfortunate, especially for the uh, torpedo squadrons. Um, so I just noticed that your your air groups don't seem to uh, really be taking it to the Japanese, I guess, and and trying to you know really kind of kind of keep the Japanese off balance uh, the way that Nagumo was sort of you know kind of hurriedly you know unsure it, it just forced uh, him to to make uh, some decisions kind of more on the fly yeah no you're definitely right they they have not gotten into action yet but, but i promise not. that's going to change pretty soon <laughs> yeah. but yeah as we said i mean the, the coordination problems are obviously much easier here yeah. um yeah, um, yeah. Um, Mark, any any uh, any uh, advice for Jared? Do you want to give him any coaching or anything like that before we, we sign off for tonight? Well, I, I don't know if that'd be fair having been able to see your screen, so I think I'll remain impartial. <laughs> I'll cheer him on. Maybe I'll tell him something, you know, a secret message or something. No, he, he's doing great. He's doing much better, so I can. So. Well, whatever happens, yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing a lot more action around Midway, obviously, than happened in reality with, with actual, I mean, we've got a legitimate invasion threat here that looks like it. <laughs> I mean, the, the garrison on Midway has been wiped out, so there's nobody left to uh, meet them on the beaches. They get to the beaches. So um, I, I think the the invasion part of the Japanese force is going to get much closer than, than, than they did, of course, in the real battle. Yeah, and we are, um, the way the turns work out here, I think we're just at the end of June 6th. So we're obviously quite a bit behind schedule in terms of the, the naval aircraft showing up. I mean, we haven't even, <laughs> there's been a few attacks, again, with the B-17s and the, some of the, the kind of the earlier scout planes, but the, the main obviously airstrikes from the carriers really have not hit yet so we're definitely it's developing at a different pace yeah that's for sure um but um like i said we'll i think we're about to get into the meat of it here in our next session so um i think uh it's going to progress pretty quickly here in terms of uh, ships starting to sink but but we'll see All right. Well, um, thank you again for everybody who's watching. Um, if you do have any, again, comments, um, suggestions for me or Jared, uh, please feel free to leave those in the comments here. Um, if you're watching live now, if you're watching on the replay, um, those are still helpful to us. We will um, we'll coordinate again, but I think we'll try to pick this up again next Thursday. We'll uh, keep doing this on, on Thursday until we're finished, but I, I'm pretty sure we are going to finish this a week from today. So uh, we'll post an announcement about that on our Facebook page, as always. So please look for it there. Uh, we'll get that scheduled. But um, expect to be here again next Thursday at 8 o'clock. 
to what I think will probably be the finale of this one. And we'll see um, if my poor defenseless Midway Island can in fact hold out. Uh, it's going to be on the Navy's shoulders this time. So we'll see if they're up to it. But thanks again for everybody for joining us, and we will see you next week. So long. Bye, everybody.